Good evening, everyone. I'm um, seeing that we have a quorum. We will begin uh, meeting this evening. This is the meeting of the Bloomington City Council's Public Safety Committee. Today's date is August 26, 2020, and it is scheduled from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge members of the Public Safety Committee. It's Council Members Isabel Piedmont-Smith, Council Member Sue Scambellari, Council Member Susan Sandberg, and I'd also, and with myself, but I'd also like to um, recognize and welcome Chief Decoff, and most importantly, members of the public that have chosen to um, tune in with us this evening. Now the announcement for the procedure for the committee questions, public comment and committee comment um, for tonight's agenda is as follows. During the course of the meeting and when not actively making a comment, members of the public will have both audio and video disabled. At the start of the meeting of the committee, at the start of the meeting, the committee will have up to 40 minutes to ask questions or make initial comments. When the chair calls for public comment, members of the public will be allowed to make one or minute and actually will decide how long public comment will be depending on how many people we estimate that are waiting to speak. Um, in the past, it's been approximately two minutes. Um, and we'll deal with that with public comment when we come to that point and public comment will last up to one hour. The public portion, public comment portion of the meeting will proceed as follows. Members of the public wishing to speak from the pub, speak during the public comment should use the raise hand feature in Zoom or indicate their desire by comp to comment by sending a chat to the meeting host. Please leave your hand raised until the clerk or the meeting host calls on you to comment. The meeting host will explain how to access the raise and hand feature. When a member of the public is called upon to speak, the clerk or the meeting host will enable audio only during that individual's comment, then disable audio when the comment is over. Speakers should state their name for the record. After public comment, the committee will have up to 20 minutes for additional questions or final comments. Okay, um, before we get started, um, committee members, we hadn't discussed a uh, procedure for presenting questions for answer from Chief Decoff. Do we have any suggestions? Um, just go around committee members one at a time. Yes, go ahead, Council Member Skembler. Thank you. Um, we do have questions. Did, did we want to, did Chief Geekoff, did you want to offer comments to begin with and then we'll follow up on that or, or should we just jump, jump into questions? I, well, I can make an opening statement if you want. I mean, I, is that what you mean? Yeah, that was my question, but I will defer to the chair on whether or not we well, should. Well, no, I think that was fine. I was trying to get format on how we ask him questions. Um, I had a little bit to finish up with before we actually oh, got started okay. in the meeting. No, you're, you're okay. fine. You're fine. Um, and thank you, Council Member Um What I want to say to the public this evening, just before we get started, this is the second meeting of the uh, Public Safety Standing Committee. Um, we also had a very long session on last Tuesday during uh, city budget presentations. Um, when we um, listened to the BPD budget presentation and we had extended public comment um, at that time. Um, the whole purpose of that, in particular for this committee, is to receive um, information and comments um, from the public. Um, at our closing comments, our final comments, I will have a few words, more words to say um, regarding next steps as we move forward. Um, but these gatherings or these previous meetings, the whole intent has been to receive as much information from the public. And again, we thank you all for participating. Um, before we get started, Chief Dekoff, if you'd like to make an opening statement. Sure, thank you very much. You know, I always welcome the opportunity to talk about uh, the, the police department and the men and women that, that serve this community on a daily basis. Um, we have a very dedicated group of individuals that work very hard every day um, to make sure that 
uh, we police in a very open manner um, and that we that we police in a very um, ethical manner. Um, there are things that happen every day around the country that that uh, uh, tarnish that uh, that uh, to tarnish our profession. Um, you know, we again just had another uh, police shooting that um, uh, again calls into question the, the the actions of police officers on a daily basis. Um, the Bloomington Police Department has been very open and transparent. We we uh, post more data sets than than most police departments around the country do. We are CALEA certified um, and we have excellent training that, that our officers go through. Um, again, as I stated, I'm, I'm uh, always happy to talk about what we do, um, but I do have one comment that I would like to make. Um, you know, we for many, many years have, have uh, um, offered a Citizens Police Academy, which gives uh, the citizens of Bloomington the opportunity to come to a program um, that is 11 weeks long that really delves into what we do as police officers here in Bloomington. Um, historically, it's had very little interest. Um, so I again, it, we're unable to do it this year because of COVID, but I would encourage the community to look for that in, in the future and attend that because it goes into a lot more depth than we're gonna be able to do tonight. Um, it's 11 weeks and so there's a lot of information is, that's covered. But I would also want to point out that um, as city council members, you also should understand what the police department does. And any time that you would like to ride, you can. Any time that you would like to attend any training, you can. Very few of you have taken me up on that. Now, conversely, I have done your job. I was on the city council as an elected member for nine years. So I understand the pressures. I understand um, the concerns that you get from the community. What I would say to you though, is you should do yourself a favor and learn more about the police department, the, the budget you vote on, because we have a very well-trained professional department that I think that a lot of people just don't understand what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would kind of issue a challenge to you that you take more of an interest and you learn more about what the police department does so that you're able to talk more about it and have a better understanding. So thank you for my uh, my chance to have comments at the opening of this. Thank you very much. Um, and before we go further, I'd like to offer our committee members um, about a minute if they'd like to have an opening statement or comment. Council Member Sandberg. No statement at this time. I'm prepared to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Scambellari. No, if you're here to get any questions. Thank you. Council Member P. Smith. Yeah, just um, to briefly respond to uh, what Chief Tikoff said, that's why we're here. I mean, that's part of why we're doing this is to learn more. So uh, we'll get to it. Okay, thank you. And before we get into questions, um, committee members, um, before we, um, we just about got started into a format on how we want to address questions. Um, and we su submitted our own questions um, or have our list of questions. And if we'd like to do more of a round robin um, format, if you think that's okay, um, then sounds good. Council Member Sandberg. Um, those questions that had already been submitted were very uh, comprehensively answered in writing. Um, is that going to be available as a public document for those that are here in this this room or for us in general before we get going and I, we've got I, some great information already i think well i know it is available and um our um, attorney administrator has a copy of that um mr lucas how do we plan to handle that uh yes i i got that uh shortly before the meeting uh chief decoff was kind enough to share that document and uh, i can make that available publicly on, uh, on the council's website um, so that folks can see that. Um, I may be able to do that while the meeting's progressing, but uh, certainly uh, after the meeting that will be available. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and they will be available. Um, some of these questions and answers um, were pretty exhausted. I'm not so sure we'll be able to get to all them in totality in our 40 minute slot. Um, so they will be available in totality, how they were asked and how they were um, answered. 
So thank you, Council Member Sandberg, for that. Um, Council Member Scambillary, would you like to get started, please? Um, yes, thank you. I think Chief C.C. Cop, one of the things you talked about um, in your opening comments was the training that our officers undergo. And I, I would just like to start, I appreciate what you provided in writing, but can you talk more um, about that and how that has evolved over time, um, particularly as Bloomington has changed over time? Sure. So the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy requires that police officers in Indiana get 24 hours of continuing education every year. Um, there's, there's certain core classes that they require, but then it's up to the individual departments to um, add to that training on areas that they want to train on. So um, we, have <coughs> we have chosen um, to... Uh, to expand that initial 24 hours. And on average, our employees receive around 90 to 100 hours of, of, of training a year, um, which is, is a substantial amount. Um, some of the key um, elements that we focus on because we deal every day with, with people who experience these types of things are mental health training. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to refer to notes so that I get the, the correct agency. So if I'm looking down and you just see the top of my head, that's why. Um, but mental health first aid, which is put on by the Nats National Council for Behavioral Health uh, Programs, crisis intervention team training, which is put on by the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. Um, we do a lot of use of force training. We do a lot of defensive tactics training. We do a lot of um, de-escalation training. Uh, all of our operational type training, such as driving, firearms, defensive tactics, they all have de-escalation training built into them so that, so that we don't have to um, necessarily rely on that training. It's more how to do that training and de-escalate that situation while you're, while you're potentially doing that training. Um, uh, again, uh, anti-bias training, implicit bias training, those are all uh, trainings that we have actually ramped up over the last couple of years. Um, unfortunately, this year has been um, very different because of COVID. We're required to do a lot more online training, um, but it's uh, some of the questions that have been asked uh, previously and some that you submitted asked about who does that training. Well, we actually do send officers to um, different trainings that they become trainers in that topic. Um, some of those are uh, de-escalation. Some of those are um, uh, anti-bias trainings. Um, but we also seek individuals from outside uh, the law enforcement world that also um, participate and do that training for us. Um, we rely on Middleway to do a lot of our domestic violence training. Um, we've relied on Indiana University uh, uh, professors to do training. Uh, we just recently um, had uh, training done in LGBTQ issues uh, by an IU professor who, who um, trained all the officers in the department. Centerstone does a lot of, of uh, mental health training with our, with our officers. Um, our own social worker who is, who is a, 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 a trainer also does some of that training for our people. So we're always looking for um, different perspectives on training. Um, there's only so many ways to, to teach a certain topic. And so each year we, we will um, look at previous trainings and what was taught and look for new programming to see um, what keeps it fresh. You know, the one thing with some of the state training is it's the same stuff every year. Um, and there's, in some of those topics, there's not much that you can change. But um, again, you get it year after year and it becomes quite repetitive. Um, some of the more more hot button topic training issues, we try to get different perspectives on those. So um, we have a full-time training officer that is always evaluating new training programs, always making sure that we meet our state mandated requirements in training. And that is, that is somebody that will continue to look at different options on training um, that our officers can do. The one thing that we must, we have to keep in mind, or I have to keep in mind as the police chief is this training must meet the requirements and the standards of the Indiana Law Enforcement Training Board, who those are the people that's, that uh, certify police officers in the state of Indiana. So that training has to meet 
their standards and pass their requirements for being training that is is uh, uh, worthy of being taught to our officers. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, I'll go next and we'll come to you, Councilman P. Musmet. Um, Chief, um, there are some in the public who view or as part of the public debate, debate on the militarization of the Bloomington Police Department, including how our CERT, uh, critical incident response team members and the armored vehicle may impact this assertion. Um, can you address that, please? So the, the militarization, <laughs> excuse me, of police is, you know, I, I, when, I, when I hear that talked about and when I look at that, um, you know, I, I think you gotta get, I think you have to get back to um, actions and not equipment. A lot of people talk about um, the armored rescue ve vehicle being a militarized piece of equipment. Well, it's not, it's a civilian model that has been sold to the military, but it is not a militarized vehicle. Um, and again, there, there are, um, you know, people refer to the police being a paramilitary organization. Um, we are not the military. We do, we do not have the same type of training that the military has. We cannot engage in the same type of behaviors that the military can. So we are, we are not militarized. Um, you know, and for instance, a, a good example that when we were talking about this earlier today is, is uh, the boots that police officers wear. When, when we first started, my very first pair of, of work shoes were, were army boots because they made them and that's, there weren't really very many other companies. Just because I wore military boots doesn't, didn't mean I, I had military attitudes. So I really think that focusing on the actions of a department versus just you know the 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 equipment that they might have is really how this should be done because um, you know the again getting back to the armored rescue vehicle it was talked a lot about um, you know uh, how it was used in other communities we've never used it like that and so um, you know we have a, a long standard. Um, of, involve, of, of engaging in community policing. You know, we try to be very open about what we do and, and um, answer those types of questions and, and come up with a, a, a variety of programs that um, are community-based solutions to, to things. And so, um, again, the military, that military militarization, you know, I always look at that as you know, people with this warrior mindset, and that's that's not what we train. That's not what we do. We have more of the guardian, and I think that's evident in a lot of the programs that we do. We were the first agency in the state to have a police social worker. We had we started our downtown resource officer program to deal with people who had homelessness issues, substance use issues, um, so that um, we weren't constantly arresting people. And so, again, I I. I I think you really have to look at the, the actions and not equipment when you talk about that. And, and we, we don't use any of, of that and we don't have those attitudes of this warrior mentality when we go out and do things. Thank you very much. Council member Pete Monsmith. Yes, um, I wanted to, uh, this is a good segue to my question actually. Um, I wanted to ask more about the civil disturbance unit within BPD and what kind of um, crowd control measures are used and what sure. kind of less than lethal uh, sort sure. of measures are authorized by BPD and when would they be used? So our, our, our CDU unit is, is really an events management group. Um, their, their primary focus is safely facilitating the event whether it's a demonstration, a protest, or celebration, um, so that no one gets hurt, uh, property doesn't get damaged, and the event can, can go off without any kinds of problems. Um, that group of officers <coughs> has um, significant training in event security, in trauma medicine, um, and, and other skills that, um, uh, such as act, active shooter mitigation. So it's, it's really not a, a proactive, uh, what you might call riot squad, because we don't have, there's, there's not enough of them to do that. Um, that would require, we put 
all of our officers out and probably rely on other agencies to, to assist if we had what you might consider a riot. Um, but they're, they're really, um, it's really set up so that they can deal with crowd management and events. Um, uh, and they're trained a little bit more than just the normal officer, because if we have some kind of major disturbance, it's going to require all of our people to work because this, this, the civil disturbance unit is just not big enough. It's probably not a good name for that unit, but that's what it has evolved into. Um, and so you asked about some of the equipment. They're all, they all have, um, all of our officers have um, gear, shin guards and um, helmets and things to, to, to protect them in case there would be some kind of major disturbance where projectiles were being thrown or whatever. Um, so that's, that's kind of, what was the rest of your question? I'm sorry. I... The um, so-called less than lethal uh, pepper balls, tear gas, sponge rounds. Can okay, you so, describe when those would be used? Sure. So um, we don't use pepper ball much anymore because um, the, uh, the, the, the pepper ball guns themselves are, are aging. And so they're, we probably only have a few left that are actually in operating condition. We do have less lethal guns that we use that are convert, <coughs> converted um, shotguns that fire uh, beanbag rounds or sponge rounds. Um, and those, those are used, um, th those are actually carried by patrol officers because uh, they encounter situations all the time where they might need access to, to that type of, of, a, of a, a weapon quickly. Um, and, and situations that those are used in would be um, someone maybe with a knife threatening suicide, um, some kind of weapon that's not a gun, um, that, that, that they could impact that person to get them to drop that thing. That's not really, the, the civil disturbance unit would have access to that, but that's not something that would be appropriate to use in a riot type situation. Um, uh, we do have uh, the availability to use tear gas, but that again, that would be used in a situation that would require uh, my approval. It, we only have a few trained officers who know how to, to, to deploy that, and it would be used in a situation that was um, probably a situation where there was uh, mass destruction of property, fires, people throwing things just what you would consider a riot type situation. It would not be appropriate at all to use any of those measures in any kind of peaceful protest or anything like that. And is the tear gas, I mean, is, <laughs> I hate to put it this way, but is it legal? I mean, there's some yes. tear gas it, that it is, is not- It, it is legal. You it, know, it, inter it, international law says you cannot use certain types on civilians. Yeah, that this is, this is, uh, totally legal uh, CS gas that is is used commonly throughout the United States by by uh, police departments. Okay, were you finished, Council Member Speed Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, Chief D. Koff, with respect to current events, and with the training that your officers um, have been receiving and are receiving. Um, the headlines across the nation are sparking protests that are absolutely justified. Um, the incidents that are happening elsewhere across the country that are targeting black individuals are heinous. And I want to know what kind of reaction are your officers expressing about that. I mean, when you're talking about de-escalation training and being a guardian mindset and not a warrior mindset, what specifically are your officers saying about how do we prevent anything like that from happening on their watch? Can you provide any um, um, assurance that this is front of mind of your department? Well, you, you know, I'll, being a police officer in this country today, you can't help but um, see what's going on. I know that, um, I, I, I know every police officer that I've talked to 
um, not only in this department, but around the state, talk about how horrific these, these uh, uh, killings are. Um, you know, it's, 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 we, police officers take these oaths to serve and protect people. Um, they don't want to hurt anyone, let alone kill anyone. And so seeing that happening around the country, um, the, the members of this agency and, and other police officers around the state that I've talked to are just in total um, disbelief that it continues to happen. And again, I don't know all the intricate details of each individual um, uh, case. You know, I see the same thing that everybody else sees on television. And so, um, you know, they talk a lot about it, um, but some of the stuff that we do um, with regards to training and um, some of the the uh, the the, the uh, programs that we have started, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, lessen the chance and the likelihood that 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 could happen. I'm not saying that a tragic event couldn't happen here because it could. But we work really hard and we train our officers really hard and, and we review situations all the time, their actions, so that um, we, can, we can try to lessen the chance and prevent those types of tragic things from happening here. Um, you know, it's, it, again, I, I don't know all of the details about all these different things that have happened around the country, but um, I, I can tell you that our officers um, get really good training. They get, um, uh, we, we have tools like less lethal options that they can use so that they don't necessarily have to go immediately to, to using a firearm to, to stop a situation. So um, again, you know, it's, it's disheartening that, that, um, that these events still happen. Um, and again, it, it does weigh very heavy on, on um, all of us at BPD that these things happen. Um, and, and my hope is that we can come through all of this discussion and through all of the change that um, things are, bad things are less likely to happen in the future. Thank you, I'll have some follow-ups, but since we're just going round robin, I mm. will pass, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief Peacock, I wonder with me on this question for a second, because I need you to help me connect some dots in my head. Um, I appreciate what you shared about training. Am, am I understanding correctly that if one of our sworn officers is in training for whatever subject, he, is, he or she is not working, correct? So they're not uh, to actually be out and well, about. Y yes and no. I mean, so, so we to, to accomplish the number of hours of training we do, we will sometimes do training on duty when they're working. Okay. Um, so some does occur while they're working, some doesn't. Okay. And my ultimate question is, we, we want to emphasize training. We want law enforcement officers to be the best training they possibly can. Yet I also know that that impacts staffing too. Um, sometimes when they're training, they're not it seems to me they're not available to be staff, and yet they're not available to be out. And yet one of our key questions in budget is about staffing and cutting sworn officers. So I'm trying to think through the connection between those two. Does that make sense? That was kind of- No, I, I think I know what you're asking. It, it is a fine line about how much training we do because it does impact staffing levels. Um, and so uh, it's, 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 I believe it's very important that we have a well-trained police department. So that's why we do as much training as we do. Having the ability to have our own trainers on staff, though, does help because we can do that training while they're working. Um, if we would have to send people out to outside uh, places to, to train, that would be a much bigger burden on staffing. Um, if we could only send officers to training when we brought somebody in, which they typically work a normal business day, so eight to five, um, you know, so having the ability to have our own trainers in-house, we can do training on night shift without altering their schedules. 
and while they're training, if something if something happens that needs those officers, they can leave training and go to those calls. So, yes, the more we train, the more that does impact staffing levels. So, um, but again, it's it's a it's a trade off. You know, we 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 pride ourselves, and that's that's actually a recruiting tool that we use is the amount of training that we we provide to our officers. So. Um, I understand what you're saying. We do watch it and it's a fine line, but um, I'm not at this point uh, willing to lessen the amount of training um, so that it it frees up more staffing. Well, and I know, and I would want to see us be somewhat uncompromising in the amount and quality of training we do, but I also know that we have to staff what we do. So yes. okay, thank you, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Captain Dekoff, my, I'm sorry, Chief Dekoff. I was years ago, sorry about that. Um, my question have, had to do with, uh, as part of budget hearings or presentations, um, there's a proposal to increase our non-badged staff, um, and specifically social workers at NROs, Neighborhood Resource Officers, by two each. Um, that'll bring you a total of three and six three and four three and four okay thank you uh, but my question is how would this increase impact the current bloomington police department organizational planning considering responding to nonviolent calls um first question of that part would they be available on call for 24 7. so no we would not have um them available 24 7. however um, it is something that <clears throat> with our social workers, probably what we will do is um, institute maybe some kind of on-call um, uh, schedule so that um, if, <clears throat> if night shift has something in the middle of the night and they need uh, the services of one of those individuals that they, they would be able to call them. Um, again, we, we have, we've looked at different um, ways to implement these these um, additional people. Uh, one of the conversations that I've had with the mayor about the neighborhood resource specialist is probably we're, we're looking at changing the name of that group because um, with us losing parking enforcement, which responded to some minor stuff for us, um, we might try to make a hybrid of what those parking enforcement people did for us and our neighborhood resource specialist did for us and combine them into kind of a new, a new unit that would be able to respond to more minor stuff that we encounter. Um, but right now, the way that we have the neighborhood resource specialist program set up, it's not real conducive to doing that. And so um, that's, that's kind of how we're looking at it. But um, I don't know if your next question is what they might respond to, so I'll go ahead and answer that anyway. Um, well, so, well if, if it's okay with you, um, I think we're getting close to our end of our time, not yet there yet. Um, so okay. I'll defer okay. on that and, um, right. and pass it on to Council Member Pete Moss Smith. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Chief Dekoff, do you think that there is systemic racism in law enforcement in this country? And what can we do about it? Um, you know, I think that that there have been areas of racism in law enforcement. Um, I can speak to our agency. I do not believe that there is a systemic racism in our agency. Um, I believe that um, we have a very um, uh, forward-thinking department. I, I believe our officers um, uh, don't have racist thoughts, don't participate in racist activities. Um, and so, um, again, I can't speak for other agencies because I'm not familiar with, with what they do. But um, I know that, that there have been, uh, in past years, uh, police departments that have been racist, um, you know, and I'm sure there are people that prior to me being on the, the police department would say that Bloomington PD was racist too. 
And again, that may be, but I wasn't there then, and I don't know what they did then. But I can tell you now that I don't believe that that occurs in the Bloomington Police Department. But uh, it it does occur elsewhere. So just as an as an overall institution, the police, you're saying that there there is some of that in the United States. And and so my next question, as a longtime professional. Uh, police officer and chief, what can we do about it? So I can tell you some steps that I've taken as the police chief here on a statewide level. So we reached out um, probably two years ago. I've been active in the Indiana Association of Chiefs of Police, and we reached out um, a couple years ago to the NAACP and to the ACLU to work to see how we could partner and work together to address some of those issues that you talk about. And so we've been having meetings the last couple of years on working on those things. Um, and it's, it's what's been beneficial is because we started that before this most recent um, incident with George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd, that made things much easier when we picked up the phone and said, let's get together and talk. And so we've been doing that. In fact, um, I pushed that we, we kind of come up with a, 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 a principles of understanding document that um, hasn't been finalized, but we were in the, we were, had been working on it when, uh, when the George Floyd killing happened. And so um, I'm hopeful that we will continue those conversations. The ultimate goal with that was to also go around the state to the different NAACP chapters and have those conversations with the local chapters. You know, we started at the state level, um, but again, it's it's what happens in the local communities, I think impacts people a lot more than at the state level. And so um, again, I, I kind of push some of that. Um, there has been buy-in from chiefs around the state to continue doing that, and, and we've met numerous times. So that's that's an example of something that we're trying to work at a statewide level to impact all agencies in Indiana. Um, I've also been very active with the International Chiefs of Police on, on hate crimes and um, uh, teaching, of, of teaching agencies, you know, the appropriate way to, to release statistics on hate crimes. Um, we're one of the few agencies in Indiana that does that. Um, but again, it's, 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 I, I think it's really important that we, we have these conversations and talk about these things because if we don't, if we can't, communicate and work through these, we're never going to be able to change anything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Thank you, um, Chief Decoff. Council Member Sandberg. And, and before you get, just before you get started, um, we're approaching our time, so I think you will be the last question, um, and then I'll have a statement right after that question okay. and answer. Very good, thank you. I wanna stay on this theme because again, we are the public safety committee and as a council and as a community, um, uh, we do not wanna see the same headlines that we see elsewhere even begin to appear in this community. So again, um, with respect to um, making sure that your officers do act appropriately. Can you talk a little bit about how you monitor them in terms of the body cams, the investigations, and have you ever let anyone go from your department who was inappropriate in their behaviors, who could not act respectfully as uh, we would wish our law enforcement to behave in this community? We have held officers accountable and we have had officers who have left the department who didn't feel like they could, they could work um, in in the environment that we want them to work in. Um, we have had body cameras for seven-ish years, six, seven years. Um, again, we, we were one of the first in the state to, to purchase those body cameras. Um, they are invaluable because they record what happens right there. Um, you know, with the situation right now in, in Wisconsin, that agency did not have body cameras, so there's going to be lots of questions of what happened. Um, hopefully, um, uh, if we would ever have a situation like that, um, we would have that video from not just one officer, but multiple officers, because um, we have policies in place that those cameras come on um, when, they, when they get out of the car. We also have car, our cameras in our cars, 
that are activated when we turn on the lights. So we're always recording what we're doing in, in situations. And so um, uh, that body cam video is, is uh, we do, they're kind of like quality control checks. Periodically supervisors will review body camera uh, footage from officers just to see what's going on. Now you have to, you have to imagine if we have a shift of 10 officers and they ha they're all working, there's lots of videos that are generated that we store. So it takes time to go through that. And if you are on one case that had five officers, there's five different viewpoints that you can look at from those cameras. So, so those are, are, are really invaluable in how we, we monitor what they do. It provides us with a, a, a lot of information that is pretty irrefutable because it's video. Um, and so, um, but to hold our officers accountable, you know, we have, um, we use a system called Guardian Tracking, which is a, 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 a system that has uh, positive things entered into it and negative things entered into it. And it also has a, the capability to red flag someone. So if we have an officer that, um, you know, under one supervisor might have done something and they put something in there and, and it doesn't get communicated, it tracks all of that and it will, it will give us a red flag warning if we have an officer that has maybe too many complaints on whatever. Um, and so we can look at that. We can go back and look at the body cams and see what they're doing. And we can either uh, institute remedial training or if necessary, if we have an officer that uh, training doesn't, doesn't change their behavior, then we can get rid of them. And we have, we have that video evidence to support that. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it'll be time for public comment here in just a second. But one thing I'd like to say before we um, get to that, we obviously didn't have time to get to all of the questions, um, but they have been uploaded to the city website and I'll do this the best I can, um, give you that um, site. Um, it is at bloomington.in.gov, .gov backslash on board backslash meeting files backslash download question mark meeting file space ID equals 7506. Um, I think Mr. Lucas can maybe repeat that before we get out of here or make sure that it's posted on our website. Um, again, thank you, Chief Decoff. I'd like for you to hang around if you, if you will. Yep. Um, now to my committee members. It's looking like we have about 81 participants. Um, I don't know how many of those would like to speak. Um, it's hard to indicate that, but we have one hour or 60 minutes for public comment. So what would be your pleasure? Should it be, we normally go two minutes for public comments. What are your feelings on that? We'll go two, two, two minutes, minutes, two minutes each until we run out of the time. Okay, and I'll have something probably say about that as well later. So, okay, um, Mr. Lucas. Uh, one other thing I will remind everyone. Uh, we don't have a visible timer, so Mr. Lucas will be keeping the time. That'll be two minutes per individual comment. Um, he'll give me a sign, and I will remind folks um, that your time is up should you exceed that. Okay, there you go, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, yes. Uh, for members of the public wishing to make a comment, uh, you can do that by either using the raise hand function, which uh, it looks like lots of folks have, have started to queue up for that. Uh, or if, if you can't access that, um, you can send a chat to the, uh, to the meeting host and I will uh, have the clerk acknowledge you uh, in order. And um, for the folks wanting to use the raise hand comment, you can click on participants at the bottom of the screen. And I believe that brings up the option to, uh, to click raise your hand. And we've got a number of folks uh, already lined up and I believe uh, the chief deputy clerk will help uh, call on folks one at a time. And I will uh, try to indicate with a, a, a time up symbol when, when folks have uh, reached the end of the two minutes. And we'll get started and I'll just remind the public that um, when you have comments, please state your full name. Who do we have up, Mr. Lucas? So um, I'll I'm be sorry, assisting. 
No, no problem. I'll be assisting with um, the order. I've been keeping tabs here and there is a list uh, right now. The first person to speak is Jada B and they should be unmuted. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. I uh, take extreme exception to Chief Dekoff's insisting that his police force is a uh, not racist police force, that none of them even have a racist thought in their brain. That is a grotesque interpretation of what is racism and what is racist in this country. I would like to know what criteria he is basing that assessment on. Who gave him that assessment? Um, uh, were there any black people or brown people involved in making that assessment of his police force, given the fact that his police force is mostly white and that he himself is white? So who is it that is, that is giving him this uh, idea that his, ra his police force is not racist. I have report after report after report from black people in this community saying that they are continually harassed by the police force in this town. We have their own statistics to prove that they are arresting black people in this community at higher rates than white people for the same crimes. So how is BPD any different than any other police force other than the fact that they aren't currently murdering black people. Not that they don't have a history of murdering black people in this town. Everybody should remember the name Denver Smith. Um, but that they aren't currently killing black people in this town. The last call that we were on last week with the city council, there were a lot of, of uh, pro-police people talking about how uh, things that are happening outside of this community um, shouldn't factor into what's happening in this community. And that's a damn lie. Last Saturday, uh, there was a violent rally by pro-police people in this town, Trump-loving uh, anti-maskers. Give me one second, I will finish. Um, and I would like to say that in the entire time that Black Lives Matter has been protesting in this town, none of our protests have been violent. It didn't take one minute until the police protests turned into a violent protest. You tell me if we are any different than anywhere else. We are not. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Bill Sanchez and they should be unmuted. Go ahead, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Sims, you are muted. I don't know if Mr. Oh, Sanchez or I'm sorry. if I'm any other folks will uh, will have the same issue. Um, so the, the clerk and the meeting host, we can't actually unmute you. We can just request that you unmute, request and enable you to unmute yourself. So uh, okay. when we do call on folks, um, you'll you'll have to take some action. So. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Sanchez was having audio issues. For any any of the other folks who have audio issues that would like to make a comment, you can uh, either type your comment into the chat and we will try to read that out loud, uh, time permitting, uh, or you can always email written comments to the uh, to the council and the committee here um, at council at bloomington.in.gov. Okay, thank you. Um, is Mr. Sanchez still I there? I believe he's, he's, he's back now, give one second. Okay. Um, I, I, make I, sure. I, okay. Go ahead. You guys can hear me now. <laughs> Sorry, I was disconnected. Can you give um, us your I'm full a, name, please? My name is William Sanchez, a resident of Bloomington, pay taxes in Bloomington. Um, I'm calling as a law student and a member of the National Lawyers Guild chapter at the Maurer School of Law, um, specifically the Intersectional Justice Committee. Uh, I wanted to bring up two points um, that some of my fellow committee members had issues with, uh, with recent events. Uh, there was a Indiana Student Daily article that went out uh, that focused on police officers in Bloomington not wearing masks. 
And additionally, one captain, I think Peta Gio or uh, uh, Captain P, I don't know what his last name was, uh, making a statement regarding questioning and rec recording of law, of law enforcement officers and uh, making a threat of arresting uh, anybody who records in questions, uh, law enforcement officers in Bloomington, uh, I believe for interfering with law enforcement duties. Uh, I just want to bring attention to the chief and just the committee and the general public uh, that there's a Seventh Circuit, Seventh Circuit case that uh, has precedent over Indiana called ACLU v. Alvarez, which constitutionally protects uh, pro public individuals, private individuals from um, to record police officers in the public. Obviously, you can't actually like interfere and like get involved in the crime scene, but you can still record. Uh, this is a Seventh Circuit case. Uh, anything, any statement otherwise from law enforcement officers in Bloomington um, is just a misrepresentation of constitutional law. Um, I hope that the chief can re-educate this captain and his uh, officers on this issue. Uh, additionally, uh, Speaking as somebody who served in the Army Reserves for over seven years, uh, it baffles me that there are law enforcement officers in this community that think that they're above the standard and shouldn't be wearing masks, especially when interacting with citizens uh, closer than six feet, arresting citizens, detaining citizens. I think it's in the best interests of the citizens and law enforcement officers to wear masks. Uh, and I would Sanchez, like a public response. Thank you for your comment. Yes. Next we, next we have Kathy Crabtree, and they should be unmuted. Hi, I'm Kathy Crabtree, Bloomington resident for over 30 years. Molly Stewart and I are making a proposal tonight that the Bloomington City Council establish a Community Advisory on Public Safety Commission, or CAPS Commission, that reports to the Bloomington City Council. We propose that several seats on the CAPS Commission be reserved for organizations that represent marginalized communities or organizations that are led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color, such as BLM Bloomington, El Centro Communal Latino, Middleway House, Indiana Recovery Alliance, Homeless Coalition, Shalom Community Center, Bloomington Chapter of National Alliance on Mental Illness, New Leaf, New Life, and a few open seats for community, community members not representing a specific group. Because public safety means different things to different people, and because the voices of some groups in our community are often not heard or listened to, the CAPS Commission would focus on reaching out to the groups listed above, among others, within our community to gather from them directly, not only what public safety means to them, but also what services might assist them in feeling and actually being safe. To be clear, the CAPS Commission would not be an oversight commission on BPD. If the city determines that an oversight commission is needed, that might fall under the purview of the Public Safety Board. The CAPS Commission is about having a broader community conversation regarding what public safety means and how we can enhance public safety for all by including full representation in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. McDowell? Next is Molly Stewart, and they should also be unmuted now. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm going to follow up on what um, Kathy said. So I'm Molly Stewart, a Bloomington resident of 10 years and professionally a researcher and program evaluator. Um, I'm gonna expand on this idea of the Community Advisory on Public Safety Commission. So we envision this commission to have two broad goals. The first being basically doing a needs assessment in terms of public safety, especially focus on groups in our community that may not associate safety with police or policing. We cannot truly serve the safety needs of the entire public until we understand what these are. Uh, we heard in the budget hearing meetings last week that the chief of police plans to measure the department's success in public safety according to the results of the city survey. But we believe that this survey does not adequately differentiate among why people feel safe or unsafe. BPD may assume that police increase the feelings of safety, but the truth is that police make some people feel less safe. We also note, as Jada noted and has uh, stories 
to share with us if we need data. We also note that the survey cannot adequately represent the entire community because it was mailed and not everyone in Bloomington has a permanent or stable address. They are community members too. So the first step in understanding public safety will be hearing from the public directly and in their own words. And this commission is aimed at focusing on voices which are not always heard either due to issues of access, time and resources, transportation and or knowledge of how they can be heard or how they can make their voices heard. And then the second broad goal would be proposing one or more solutions. And this must obviously be shaped by the information collected in the needs assessment. Uh, we believe that one solution might be the development of a 311 resource and possibly a change in dispatcher procedures so that calls do not necessarily go to the police. This would cut down on the police burden, which is clearly an issue, um, and to solve issues that cannot, can be addressed by other services. And it may also allow some folks to reach out for help who might not feel comfortable reaching out to the police and are not getting help when they need it. So um, that is our idea and we'd love to talk about it further with the council and anyone else who's interested, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Lisa Paduka and they should be unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can, you have two minutes, can you? State your name, please. Yes, my name is Lisa Podolka, P-O-D-U-L-K-A, and I'm a Monroe County resident and a recent graduate of Indiana University. And um, I would just like to commend Jada B for everything that she said and echo what she's saying. Um, and she's definitely, certainly more qualified to speak um, as to whether BPD is racist or not. But I do entirely agree that just the idea of not having a racist thought that the chief pointed out earlier is not the same thing as not being a part of the systemic racism and white supremacy of this country um, that is deeply reflected in the police force all across this nation. Um, I also have concerns about the militarized equipment that was brought up earlier um, and follow up questions about that. And I have to say, I don't really understand the um, justification or the, you know, the, the trying to uh, lessen the worry by saying that, oh, just because we have it doesn't mean we use it, because if there's no intention of using it at some point, why do we have it in the first place? So because we have a bear cat and because we have less than lethal weapons that have proven time and time again to actually cause great harm to individuals, um, it doesn't make me feel better that the aim is to not use them. If we have them, we can use them. Um, and then finally, this may seem like a small thing, but I would like to reference part of the original slideshow from last Tuesday's meeting. Um, quote, reduce part one crimes, including burglaries, robberies, and thefts by 3% by using enhanced technology and data-driven strategies to modify patrol patterns to address problems as they arise. Um, and I was wondering about what this enhanced technology is, whether it's facial recognition software, and to point out that um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, spe specifically uh, Chief Dikoff, that um, facial recognition software, if that is something that's included in this enhanced technology, has been proven to disproportionately misidentify um, people of color and women. Um, and those are all my commentary. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Lauren Skelton, and they should be unmuted. Some of you have heard me before. I brought to you the idea that the bear cat was simply- Pardon me, pardon me, I'm sorry, I don't wanna hurt you. Can you pronounce your full name, please? Lauren Skelton. Thank you, sorry about that. That's okay. Some of you have heard from me before. I brought to you the idea that the bear cat was simply oversized body armor, which is how it has been used, much like a bulletproof vest, the primary purpose of which is officer protection. The Novak study has been unquestioned regarding any other department in the city. If there were concerns about the validity, they should have been addressed before taxpayer dollars were spent on it. And further, quite honestly, nobody could evaluate any police department unbiasedly at this point due to widely politicized perceptions influenced by a variety of factors. It's not about validity. The questioning of that study is about politics and perception. As far as turnover, my personal information results in a 47% turnover rate at BPD. But sure, rounding down to 10% divided over four years sounds better. It is rounded down to 10% over the course of the last four years, which results in a 47% actual current turnover rate. 
do your research. Morale was bad before political perceptions made it unbearable. BPD takes four to five times the required amount of training, but it would never be enough. I heard people say last week that racial bias training doesn't work, yet BLM is demanding that the police department and city council members take their training. I also heard last week that my voice as a police wife was invalid. I've got to tell you, that's ridiculous. I'm the one who sends the love of my life out the door into a world that hates him, not knowing if he will come back home. I'm the one who has to explain to my children why he's still at work hours after he was supposed to be home or called in on the days that he was supposed to be off, often on special family holidays. I'm the one who has to take those children to the hospital to visit their dad after the people he protects and serves destroy him on multiple occasions. I attended the Back the Blue rally last weekend, which was absolutely not immediately violent. As a matter of fact, those in attendance even politely cleared the sidewalk upon the arrival of BLM. Unfortunately, BLM was not willing to stop with a peaceful passing through, and I watched them continue to reinsert themselves this. in various spaces throughout the event until they encroached upon the physical space of several individuals enough to cause them to feel that they needed to defend themselves. Ms. Do you Skelton, know what they I'm did? Sorry. They Ms. called Skelton. the cops. They called the cops. Miss Skelton. Irony in that. I'm sorry, we've come to the end of that time. Thank you for your comment. Next is uh, Elizabeth Williams, and they should be unmuted. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a few things to can say. You, can you give us your full name, please? Yes, Elizabeth Williams. Thank you. So I've taken a look at the document listed in the chat with various questions answered. And this states that 40.6% of black individuals arrested in Bloomington listed their home address as being outside the city of Bloomington. I'm wondering if we have any information for white individuals arrested in Bloomington, because um, I'd be curious to see if there's a disparity there or if the numbers are actually somewhat similar. Um, also, I would like to see the Bloomington Police Department get rid of the Bearcat and substitute it with another vehicle that is not associated with violent state responses to community uprisings. I think that this would be a good step towards listening to the concerns of black and other minority residents, which were already ignored when the Bearcat was acquired. I also understand that Chief Decoff emphasized actions, not equipment with regard to the militarization of police. However, why do we even need military equipment in the first place? I'm not concerned about things like boots, but I am very concerned about things like combat vehicles, and other equipment that arms the police and gives them excessive firepower and other military power over citizens. One other thing I noticed in the report with questions is that we still allow no-knock warrants in Bloomington. Why is this the case? Just because they are rare and they have to be approved by a judge does not mean that they are justified or okay. I think that we should strongly reconsider this policy and consider getting rid of no-knock warrants altogether. Finally, I would like to second Jada B's comments and note that I think that members of BPD should seriously take a look at themselves and their organization and try to determine the ways in which they are still as a systemic structure contributing to white supremacy. Racism is not just about being in the Klan or expressing negative views about people of color. It's something that's systemic. It shows up in more subtle attitudes and interactions. And it's something that BPT can't get rid of if it doesn't listen to local people of color, which as of right now, they have not had a great track record with. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have James Haverstock New, and they should be unmuted. Thank you so much, James Haverstock. I am noticing that there is an incredible amount of emotion being expressed tonight. And the same was true at our last meeting. When emotion meets logic, logic takes a back seat. What the emotion, the anger, some of it righteous, has failed to do is address the fact that BPD is terribly understaffed. If we don't go on the numbers, on the science that we have on the data that's provided to us, we're left with emotion. And emotion leads to, I think, I wish, I want, and that's not going to solve our problem for us. We paid a great deal of taxpayer money for a study that is comprehensive. I urge you to please take a look at that study. It is the one that details how understaffed we are. 
how violent crime is increasing in Bloomington. And I fail to realize, and I ask you in all sincerity, how will reducing the number of sworn officers make us safer? I ask you to make additions to the department, not to make reductions. And I thank you for all the attention that you give based on the data and not on the emotion. Thank you for your comments. Next is uh, Jana Arthur, and they should be unmuted. Earlier, Chief Dekoff stated- can, can, I'm sorry, can you pronounce your full name, please? Oh yeah, sure. My name That's is Jana, Jana, Thank you, Jana Arthur. Do I have Thank my you. full time? No, we've got that. That's fine. Thank you very much. Chief Dekoff stated something about dealing with the homeless, and that was really offensive to me. Um, and he said that he was going to send traffic enforcement officers along with social workers and resource officers. Um, and I thought that was pretty bizarre. Kathy is forming the CAPS, I think it's called, about safety. And I just wanted to share something that's happening in our town that is not safe for people. Um, there are fraternities at Indiana University, I have heard, that are having hazings where they are attacking people on the switchyard uh, trail and that isn't safety. Uh, also cops don't mean safety to everybody. Healthy communities mean safety. Um, and I was also frustrated with the disgusting and accusatory remarks that a prior speaker said about BLM and I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Next is Rhett Salisbury and they should be unmuted. Yes, my name is Rhett Salisbury. I'm a longtime Bloomington resident. I actually moved away from, to Virginia for a while, but I decided to come back. Thank you for allowing me to speak for the safety of Bloomington. For the record, I'm not employed by the Bloomington Police Department. I have no family members connected to the police department. The only times I'm, I've spoken to them lately, to a police officer lately, is when I called because I want to set up a neighborhood watch. We have had an uptick of attempted break-ins and also da petty damages, one of which was at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. My wife was home by herself. She's blind, by the way. And somebody's trying to break into the back door. Last year, Bloomington showed support for the police in their 2020 budget review by the city council that the current administration was fully committed to and invested in public safety. Commitment was to be demonstrated by the hiring of eight new badged officers, two resource specialists, and after hours ambassador in addition. In addition, the goal was expressed to have reached one officer per 1,000 population, which is about national average. What that would be this, put us up at 121, not 105, not 100. My question is, what has changed from last year and this year? The only difference I know of is the shift in political winds, the political climate. Since we're having this discussion, that shows that you are basing your decisions on the shifting sands of temporary politics. What polls and statistics and studies have you listened? And I'm not talking about the hate built vitriol that I heard from, especially the first speaker, but actual logical study. One study that we did was that we should have more police. Well, why- I'm sorry, Mr. Sals Mr. Money. Salisbury. Yes sir. yes, sir. I'm sorry, we're, can you just really finish up with a couple words? Okay, really quick. Really quick. I would like, okay, I would request you to represent us, Bloomington, by supporting the police by at least keeping the same number of badged officers and adding additional support of the non-badged caseworkers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Next up is Danielle Bird, and they should be unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Miss Bird, yes. Now, this is Danielle Bird. 
Um, and I just wanted to say that I wholeheartedly agree with Kathy Crabtree and Molly Stewart on the establishment on a CAPS commission to research public safety and uh, to talk to the vulnerable populations uh, as to how they view safety, which is very different than um, many other people. Also, I do wanna urge Chief Decoff to take the offer by BLM Bloomington to receive some education. Um, there was a, some deficits in his understanding of systemic racism. Um, and when we have disproportionate numbers of black individuals involved in, in the policing and criminal justice in Bloomington, we have systemic racism. It's not about individual thoughts or individual behavior. It's about that collective um, issue. Also, um, as a social worker, I urge you to please not approve social workers to be embedded into BPD. Social workers employed by police is not a progressive move at all. It's misguided to align social work with law enforcement. Social workers should never be used as agents of social control or seen as part of the law enforcement system. It harms our profession in other ways that we're working with folks. Um, also, uh, we definitely can provide social work outside of the law enforcement. I know social workers are of value to the community. Um, I just want to point out in Eugene, Oregon, CAHOOTS, which is a crisis intervention program, was able to respond to 20% of the area's 911 calls last year. And through that program, teams of medics and experienced mental health professionals are dispatched to handle certain emergencies instead of the police. I just believe Bloomington can and, and should be able to provide for our citizens in a different way. And there are models out there and I'm really looking forward to thinking outside the box and not going with this uh, social work employed by uh, law enforcement solution. Okay, thank, thank you for your comments, Ms. Burt. Next is Keegan G and they should be unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name is Keegan Gulick. Uh, I'm a Bloomington resident, and uh, I just wanted to join in the calls for defunding the police and investing in alternatives and social services. Uh, many people do speak to the positive steps that BPD has taken, uh, but unfortunately, I don't believe that the, they are enough. When people say defund the police, I think it means that we need to reallocate our resources to deal with the root of crime. Um, police as an institution are not set up to deal with the societal problems that lead to crime in the first place. Um, I think that we need more resources for affordable housing, social services, and alternatives to the police. Um, the point is to create conditions where police, as we know them, would not be necessary. And I think that this is something that we can do as a community, and it actually would be the more logical and efficient way to reallocate our resources. And there are examples like of programs throughout the country, like CAHOOTS, um, which like the last speaker said, handles 20% of 911 calls in Eugene, uh, but is only around 2% of their budget. Um, so I think that would be a more efficient way to allocate our resources. Um, you know, I just think that we should take more concrete steps towards changing how we think about public safety in Bloomington. Um, it's not just a question of how we allocate resources, but how we deal with systemic racism um, in our community throughout our criminal justice system and police. We need structural chains and drastic measures that meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our community. So that's, that's my comment. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next is Nate R. And they should now be unmuted. Are you there, Nate? Are you there, Nate? It looks as though he's, uh, Nate's yeah. unmuted, although I'm- Can you hear me? Yes, oh, we can. Can you, thank you. Can you state your full name? Hello, my name is Nathan Rosenblum. Uh, I'm also a resident of Bloomington, as I think many of us are. And I would first like to address the comment that, um, the Bloomington Police Department is not a systemically racist organization. Um, I know that other people have, have mentioned this, but I would like to say that it is misguided to, to say that when 
people of color are disproportionately targeted for use of force and disproportionately the subject of arrest. Um, that defines a systemically racist organization. Um, you might ask, or you might say, as the document does, that that is because these are the people for whom the police are called on. These are the people who are experiencing homelessness at a higher rate. Um, and the question obviously there is, well, what is what are the police supposed to do about that? Um, and the answer is they're not equipped to deal with that, which is why we need services that uh, solve the root problems. Um, we mentioned CAHOOTS um, already, which um, does respond to 20% of Eugene, Oregon's 911 calls and goes through their regular dispatch. Having a service like that here that could, for example, um, refer people to the Stride Center, where right now you would have to be referred by a police officer, um, would be a great step um, towards reducing uh, uh, or increasing services towards the most vulnerable members of our society. Um, also, I'd like to respond to some of the claims in the document that um, social workers and resourcers, uh, downtown resource officers, et cetera, need to be part of the police department in order to share information or have access to officers in case of emergencies. Those are- hey, Nate, oh. I'm sorry. We're approaching the end of your two minutes. Okay. Um, okay. There are many options we have, and they don't all involve armed officers. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Next is Kel, and they should be unmuted. Hi, my name is Kelly Everett. I've been a resident of Bloomington for a little over a year. I want to say I support everything that Jada B said. I also um, am extremely offended and uh, that the chief of police won't even admit that there is racism within the police force. That's just, um, it's trying to stay out of my emotions, but it's offense, it's a lie. It's just a straight up lie. And that is, uh, that's why we want to defund the police. They're not willing to meet people with, they're not willing to be flexible on anything. They won't admit fault. They won't acknowledge what we're just bringing to them to say, hey, this is what we want. This is what we need. And we're just met with, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a white person. I'm safe. I'm okay. I'm speaking out for everyone else out there who's not being protected. When they are, we're doing everything to show you what we need and the police are just aren't doing their jobs. And that's why we need to be defunded because they're not gonna change. They're not, they're not willing to meet us at all. And that's all. Thank you for your comments. Next is Nathan Mutchler, and they should be unmuted. Are you there, Nathan? I am attempting to unmute Mr. Mutchler's account and uh, yes I'm not... sorry about that um can you hear me okay yes we can can you give us your full name please yes my name is nathan mutchler i am also a bloomington resident um thank you i want to start by echoing and supporting everything that jada b said um she said everything i wish i could say much more artfully passionately and better than uh than i could articulate um i would humbly ask that the council uh, take the uh, $41,500 in the budget for handguns, rifles, less lethal rounds, um, body armor, uh, patrol and critical incident, and use that for something that actually will, will give back to the community. Well, some blankets, medicine, food, shelter, um, I think that there is a, a misconception um, that policing is uniquely dangerous. Uh, policing is hard work. Work is hard. I work in a kitchen. That's hard work. Uh, according to OSHA, uh, police is the 14th most dangerous occupation with approximately uh, 14 fatalities, sorry, 14 injuries 
per 100,000 workers. Nationwide, the median annual wage is $59,680. Um, I would argue, like all of our wages, that's probably too low. And uh, like all of our injuries, that's probably too high. However, garbage men are the number five uh, most dangerous profession with uh, over twice the fatal injuries per 100,000, 34 uh, fatal injuries per 100,000 workers, and a median annual wage of $35,000. So for, for this council or for anyone to clutch at their pearls and to say that uh, we have to fund our dangerous police and it's so hard, they need these weapons, they need these things that kill and maim and hurt our children, and our families and our loved ones, I would just ask, where is that same compassion when it comes to our sanitation workers, when it comes to our fire department? Um, Mr. Mutchler, I hate to be rude. Thank you very much for your comments. Next is Katie Reitmeyer, and they should be unmuted. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to go ahead and echo Nathan, what you just can, said. Can you, can you please pronounce your full name, please? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I prefer to go by Kate, Kate Reitmeyer. Um, I just wanted Thank to- you. Thank you, Jim. I wanted to go ahead and echo Nathan in that no one ever said F the fire department. Um, so the, okay. So I'm a social worker here in Bloomington. I studied under Donnell Bird um, and Donnell taught me well. And I know that social work as an arm of the criminal justice system does not work. I wanted to read as fast as I can from this article, this slate article from Lori James Towns, who's the um, director of the Office of Public Defenders in Maryland. And here we go. The need to separate social work from policing, therefore, is not just a practical outcome oriented matter. It is a moral imperative. Social workers must not be complicit in a system of violence bounded on racial oppression. We already have enough to work to do as a profession to reckon with our own role in perpetuating social control through jails and prisons, community supervision, and child protective services. The racist past and present of policing in this country is at direct odds with social work as a profession. Our ethical principles of our commitment to our clients and their self-determination and the importance of human relationships in helping our clients in our work there is no place for the isolation, shame, and violence that are hallmarks of policing. Black Lives Matter, I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Next is Brittany Jarrett, and they should be unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. Oh, my name is Brittany Jarrett. I'm a Bloomington resident, taxpayer of 16 years. Prior to my 16 years in Bloomington, I grew up in Hammond, Indiana. If you aren't familiar with Hammond, it's a very unsafe area due to like a lot of violence, uh, gangs, things of that nature. Uh, gangs that include people of all races. My father was an officer of the Hammond Police Department for 30 years. He was on SWAT and the gang unit. And I was terrified every day that my father wouldn't make it home because when he went to work due to the massive violence he faced, not violence he was behind, violence he had to protect his community from. Might I add that department currently has 211 sworn officers. Now living in Bloomington, I'm married to an officer of the Bloomington Police Department. I am more terrified today that when my wife goes to work, she won't come home. And I'm more terrified of that than I ever was for my father. The current staffing levels at BPD are unsafe. The citizens of the community aren't safe and the officers themselves aren't safe. I would hope that you as the Public Safety Committee and members of the City Council would open your eyes to see that there is more than just political or racial issue going on right now. They are understaffed, end of story. I heard someone say we need a healthy community. This doesn't mean we need less police or to reallocate our resources. We need to start with a full staff and build on that to make sure that our community is safe first from crime, more community outreach if they're feeling unsafe not necessarily more non-sworn employees. Um, I heard someone state policing as hard work and then advised we should be compassionate to our sanitation and fire departments. I'd like to remind everyone listening that we have no understaffing in our sanitation or fire departments. Um, I'd like us all to you know, remember that while there's a lot of people on here saying 
there's stuff that can just be passed off to another service. It's not necessarily true just because those people are saying it. Um, everyone is, that, that's saying that seems to be just assuming that a non-sworn employee can handle more than the situation entails. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Taylor Pendleton, and they should be unmuted now. Hey, can you guys hear me? We sure can. All right, thank you. So, uh, can, you, can you say your full name, please? Yeah, it's Taylor Pendleton. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so looking into kind of what we've been talking about, defunding the police, um, I've been looking at a lot of the news articles that are going on, going on as well as being a member of uh, the uh, pro-police rally that happened this past weekend here in Bloomington uh, and realizing that we had six uh, of the Bloomington Police Department guys on staff there, yet we still had several injuries that occurred between the counter protests that showed up um, and were striking people in the face with batons. Uh, we had guys who charged their weapons and started leveling them off as in the intent to fire those rounds into the protesting crowd. And the only people that were there were uh, security, uh, M MSI security. Uh, so my question as we're talking about defunding the police, not giving them weapons and body armor is, uh, if we look at just uh, yesterday, there were three shot and two fatally injured up um, at one of the protests from a militia group. So is the intent for us to defund the police department to the point where now private citizens are, are desire, desiring to protect their city? and that we have to then ensue the aftermath of what is to come? Um, or are we going to you know, look at the actual statistics of what Bloomington presents, which is one in 27, um, as you are likely to be a victim of either property and or violence uh, here in Bloomington? Um, speaking to these guys who are, you know, the, the guy who mentioned he works in a kitchen uh, well, unfortunately, the guy who works in the kitchen isn't necessarily, when he goes to a call, have his life potentially taken from him from some person who wants to go suicide by cop. Um, so not only is a guy who spent 14 years in the military, but also three of those years as a law enforcement officer myself, um, my questions to those people who are, are talking about defunding the police and putting social workers in and now harm's way is at what point do we realize that social workers um, are not trained if the situation should escalate uh, to the point where they do need police? And then what is the expected response time I'm, of- I'm sorry, Mr. Pendleton, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Sorry, didn't mean to be rude. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. McDowell? Next is Savannah Perlman and they should be unmuted. Hi, my name is Savannah Perlman. Uh, I want to start by saying you choose to be a police officer, but you don't choose to be black. <laughs> um, a previous speaker was concerned that emotion prevents us from using our logic. So that's fine. Let's look at the facts. We know the BPD disproportionately targets black members of our community. Since 2016, 24% of instances of use of force were against black people. And yet Bloomington is only less than 5% black. And yet, despite these facts, we all heard Chief Tikoff say that racism doesn't exist in Bloomington, and none of the police officers here have ever had a racist thought. So something's false, and it's not the statistics. We're not claiming that every police officer has bad intent, right? Bad intent is not a requirement for being racist, nor is it required for acting in racist ways or upholding racist systems. Continuing to fulfill the request for increased budget and increased staff is ignoring the elephant in our country right now. Three days ago, we saw a police officer shoot a black man in the back seven times in front of his three children. So our question is to decide what we do in Bloomington to meet this moment. As we head into the third night of watching police use tear gas, especially police family members to consider why people are protesting in the first place. And it's not because we hate individual police, it's because we see the murders over and over and over and enough is enough. Police violence is real. Police violence targets people of color. Police violence is preventable. Limit access to militarized weapons and get serious about introspection. The first step is admitting that racism is here. It's in our town, it's in our police force. And for all these reasons, I'm in favor for relocating and reinvesting funds 
from BPD into our community. Black Lives Matter, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. McDowell? Next is uh, Rachel Batkar. Batka. Um, and they should now be unmuted. All right, can you hear me? Sure can. All right, perfect. So my name is Rachel Batka. I want to start off with my quick note. There should be no debate as to whether or not police should be wearing masks during this time, whether or not anybody is in their car, um, whether or not it takes them two extra seconds. COVID is the number one killer of cops in 2020 drastically. Um, moving on from that, I was hearing, I recall hearing earlier about police safety facility uh, facilitating during events so that no one gets hurt, no property gets damaged. With this, I would like to know where this crowd control was when the Trump rally took place at the courthouses last Saturday. It was supposed to be a black to blue rally, but in all reality, there were way more Trump flags. Um, there was no social distancing at this event, no masks were being worn, and there was little to no interference when literally every single person of color who was counter protesting was violently assaulted. Um, on, the, on the contrary, last summer in the farmer's market, there was a woman holding a sign against fascism and she was arrested. Um, at the Trump rally, there were multiple militiamen who were toting guns and the police presence there was minimal, if any at all. I believe somebody mentioned that there was security there. Um, and with that, I would like to request that the police department reconsiders who is really a risk and who is just using their voice. Um, and I would like this reasoning to be based on logic. With that being said, Black Lives Matter, I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Sam Barbash Riley, and they should be unmuted. Hello, my name is Sam Barbash Riley. Um, I am a resident of Monroe County, specifically Bloomington. Also, a social worker would like to echo what other social workers have said. We should not become complicit in the violence police continue to commit. Um, I'd also like to echo everything Jada B has said um, and would say take BLM training, specifically because it's evident from the statement that um, there's just no racist thought um, in the police department. Um, I think that there's been a lot of research to show that majority of people have some sort of racist thought. We are raised in a racist society. Um, to leave untouched from that is just not possible. Um, I'd also like to say, if we're not planning on using the Bearcat, sell it. There's no reason to have that, you know, when that could be money that's better spent elsewhere. Um, I would like to encourage us to reallocate these funds rather than continuing to police our neighbors, um, spe specifically over police people of color and people who don't have the finances that they need to live, um, put that money towards healthcare, put that money towards housing. These are the things that are going to get at upstream the causes of you know, these different things that we're so concerned about. Um, if we're worried about you know, people breaking in, um, if we're worried about you know, police needing to get called into domestic violence situations. The way to address that is by giving people better access to housing that's more stability. They don't have to stay in violent situations. Lastly, because I know I'm running out of time, um, to whoever said that social workers don't need to get into violent situations um, and aren't trained in de-escalation. Um, obviously, you don't know much about social work because this is something that we do have to learn, um, and I've regularly gone into situations that are definitely most people would raise an eyebrow at, um, and I am trained in de-escalation. I don't okay. need a gun. Sorry, to Sam. Sam, I'm sorry, I hate to be rude, but we've come to the end of your time. Thank you for your comments. Next is Daniel Bingham, and they should be unmuted. Hi, there's so much that's gone by and so much to cover. It, it bears pointing out that there would not be any chaos in Kenosha, Wisconsin right now 
if the police had not murdered a black man in broad daylight and then resisted all accountability for it. That city would be peaceful right now if the police had A, done their job right in the first place, or B, held their own accountable. The chaos is their damn fault. The militiaman who murdered two people was greeted by police officers before he committed that act of violence. They thanked him for his presence. They offered him water. He was underage and, in fact, in violation of the open carry laws. And he was in violation of the police enforced curfew. They did not ID him. They did not arrest him. They could have done both and prevented those killings. They didn't. After he shot those men, those people, they allowed him to walk away from the scene and only arrested him later. So that's really not a good example of police, proper police conduct. We need to question whether or not police are even effective. We, we, we've talked so much about the racism embedded, the, the white supremacy embedded in the system, um, the harms police commit, but we need to question fundamentally whether police even actually keep us safe. The national clearance rates for property and violence crime indicate that they do not. They aren't solving crime, they're not preventing crime. Clearance rates for violent crime on the national level are less than 50%. The clearance rate is the rate of the, the percentage of cases in which an arrest is made, less than 50%. Half of violent crime goes unsolved. For property crimes, it's 17%. 83% of property crime goes unsolved. Policing as we do it today doesn't work. It doesn't keep us safe, and it puts marginalized people and people of color at risk. That includes here in Bloomington. So the, the, when we're starting with the funding, the place to look, to, you know, we, we do have to do it gradually. Start by looking at what's on the police plate that can be easily moved off. And in the meantime, look into what we can do differently with violence. Mr. Bingham, we're not doing Mr. That Bingham I, I hate to be rude. Yeah, time's up. Thank you for your comments. Next is Makube Reese, and they should be unmuted. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Maquiba Reese, and I am on the Board of Public Safety here in Bloomington. Um, I actually just got off of a call with all my students. Um, our student, my students just got back, um, and I work for the Kelly School of Business. Um, I just wanted to share just a couple of things, a couple of facts. Um, as I mentioned, I am one of the board members. There's five of us on the board. I'm a black woman, very active in the community, seeking social justice, and I'm also a social worker. Um, and so, while I'm on the board of public uh, on the board of public safety, we basically over we um, make sure that the police officers um, we meet with the chief of police, and we also meet with the fire chief uh, monthly. And so, just real quick, I wanted to reiterate that the Bloomington Police Department they do implicit bias training and have implemented the eight can't wait. And some people have misconception that it started uh, years and years ago. It is five years old. And the individuals who started that is D. Ray McKesson and Brittany Packnett, who are very active so, um, social justice and um, individuals who are part of the Black Lives Matter. Um, and so that's something that's only been, it's been five years. And so something that we've been doing uh, for individuals, if they would like, go ahead and go to our meetings. We share the eight can't wait so people know what that means and how what that entails. And that on that board, we have a black male, we have me as a black woman, um, we have another uh, other individuals who oversee our chief of police and our um, fire police um, and our police officers. And so you can reach out to me actually if you have, if you would like. Um, my email is mqb.reese at r e e s e at gmail.com. Um, we're here as a conduit uh, to help support community trust. Um, and so that's why I'm here is to let you know that the Board of Public Safety is not controlled by anybody. I have my own voice. Um, and so go ahead and shoot, some, shoot me an email if you have some issues. But as of uh, what I've seen so far the past three years, McQuiba, I'm sorry, you've come to the okay. end of your time. Okay, well, thank you. I just wanted to share that real quick. Thank you very yes. much for your comments. Next Okay. Um, well, actually, um, thank you for that. We 
were to end public comment at one hour at 740. It's now 741. I would um, ask the folks who were still here, and I do apologize. Um, we have limited time, but there are some folks who still have some comments, um, I think. I would suggest that you send them to our council office. That's council at bloomington.in.gov and your responses or your messages will be sent to us committee members and us council members at large. Um, it is now time to move to final council comments. Um, I will do this by alphabetical order, I do believe. I think that's the best um, case to do that. Um, council member Sims. Yes, sir. Can I have just a couple of minutes to clarify a couple of things? Uh, yes, you can. Thank right, first you. Of all, I don't think what I said earlier about policing and systemic racism, racism came out um, the way that it, it sh I intended it to. Certainly, there is there is systemic racism racism in policing um, throughout history, and it still exists today. We all have racist thoughts, um, but we work really hard to to overcome those those racist. Um, Thoughts. We work really hard to come up, the, uh, overcome those racist legacies. That's why we continue to do training, and hopefully that training will will stop those actions from coming out. So I just want to clarify that that I, I don't believe that there's no racist activity, no racist police officers, um, but we we continue to train so that we can we can address that and and stop that. Um, masks were m mentioned a couple of times. There was an article in the IDS uh, this week that. Um, I take issue with. I don't think it was quite accurate. Um, our officers are required to wear face masks. Um, they are not required to wear them when they are in their vehicles, but when they interact with the public, they are required to do that. Um, and somebody mentioned something about uh, facial recognition software. We are not using any of that. The, the increased technology is mapping software. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your input, Chief Deacon. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, I just do want to say um, I do apologize to anyone who I'm mean, hope no one is offended that we couldn't get to um, the few public commenters that were left. Um, we have had a series of these meetings we will continue to have. So we try to limit them so um, uh, we can make as much progress as we can. Um, we're now down to council, I'm sorry, committee members final comment times going by um, Alphabetical order. We'll start with Council Member Isabel Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, thank you uh, both to members of the public and to Chief Decoff for um, the discussion tonight. I still have a lot of questions. I, um, I think some members of the public uh, have read more of the written responses than I have because uh, I work full time and I just got them this afternoon. So um, I was shocked. I was shocked that BPD sometimes uses no-knock warrants. And Chief Decoff, I, I know it. You know, there's further details in here about how it takes a judge's order and all that. Um, but can you guarantee me that a situation like Breonna Taylor cannot happen in Bloomington? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I allowed to not allowed to ask a question, Councilmember Sims? Well, we're committee members. Um, I don't want. Um, we it wasn't intended for public to to ask directly the chief. I don't really see a real issue with committee members. He's here, and you're here. We take great strides to prevent those types of things. Um, I don't know all the details of what happened there. What I have seen. Um, we certainly would have done things differently in that situation. Um, so we take, we take tremendous steps to make sure that a situation like that would not occur here. Can I say 100% that it would never happen? No, I don't think anybody can. But we take great strides to lessen the chances that that would happen. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think this is a question that I'll bring to the Board of Public Safety for further discussions. Um, but just, just in general, I think that uh, 
it's it's clear that that some people that are here today um, do need to learn more about systemic racism and that it's not about racist actions, it's about racist systems. Um, and I also think that uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued and uh, supportive of the, of the basic idea that Kathy Crabtree and Molly Stewart brought forward of a community advisory on public safety commission. And I'd really like to explore that further. Um, but I do want to uh, give my colleagues uh, time for their remarks as well. So I will, I will stop now. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Councilmember P. Mossmith. Um, Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. Our whole purpose here is to problem solve and make decisions. And we have some difficult, one, difficult ones ahead of us. Um, we're getting to better understanding throughout these listening sessions, but we have a long way to go. We're not there yet. I'm not hearing a whole lot different from some of our previous opportunities to hear from the public, uh, but it does reinforce the need to take a look at um, things from both the police department as well as from the community, as well as um, individuals who do fear the police and have a good reason to. Um, systemic racism exists very clearly in that some people view the police as protectors and assets to the community, a, a very important element of public safety, and yet other people fear the police for their own perspectives and their own histories and in seeing what's going on across the country and what has been going on for a long time with respect to social injustice. And so clearly we have a lot of passion. We have a lot of emotion. That's not a bad thing. That motivates us to get out and to speak up and to take a look at things with a very cruel and a very discerning lens and see what we can do to course correct. I've heard a lot of things tonight about the root causes of crime. Now I'm a social worker too, that's my background. And I'm well aware that social workers are highly trained in de-escalating and working with difficult people. Um, and I also hear the concerns about the mix and mingling of social workers in a police department and, and how do those roles square up and perhaps how do they not square up because again, the police are not responsible for the root causes of crime. The police respond to reports when a crime is being committed and someone calls 911, the police are the first responders. That's their role. If we're talking about root causes of any number of social ills in our community, social workers alone are not the saviors. And again, from being a social worker and, and working in a system that was dealing with the problems of child abuse, of child um, sexual abuse, um, neglect, it's, it's very, very difficult to get to the root causes of anything that causes some of our systemic ills. And so we're placing an awful lot of responsibility at the feet of two uh, industries, policing and social work, that the broader community has to address, um, all of us do. And so um, roles are gonna be very difficult to try to tease out who's responsible for what, who's accountable for what, and how do we address people's fears? And they are legitimate and they are very real and black lives and certainly black lives matter. That is not even a question that anybody should be debating here. What we are debating though is about the professionalism of the police department, the training they need, the staffing they need in order for us to make sure that they are not gonna slip up and we are not gonna become yet another city with another horrible headline and another black life taken. That is not what any of us want. That's the common ground here. And so what we have to do respectfully and with our passions in check work toward that solution. That's what I intend to do as a member of this committee and this council. That's what I will encourage our mayor to do. And that's what all of us has, have a responsibility to do, the public safety for everyone in this community. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Council Member Scambleri. Thank you. Um, 
Council Member Sandberg, I very much appreciate what you said about let's figure out where we do have common ground and what we do want. So thank you for that remark. Um, Chief Decoff, thank you for being here. To all of those of you who have offered public comment, both here and at other meetings, um, thank you for being part of this conversation. It is really important to me personally and in this role to make decisions after hearing a range of viewpoints. And so I'm grateful you have taken time. Um, I do want to echo one thing Chief Decoff said at the very beginning of this evening. He encouraged uh, council members to know everything they can about DPD and how it works and to consider doing a ride along. Um, I am a, a new council member. I was just sworn in in January. And so I purposefully sought out a chance to do a ride along. I've attended some roll calls and spent time with DPD leadership. When I've met with members of the nonprofit and social service community here in town, I've specifically asked their perspective about DPD too. Um, and I think those are opportunities we all have. And I just found it very, very helpful for me. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, and it does make sense that we all know as much as we can. Um, two areas of questions I still want to explore at some point whenever that opportunity presents itself. And I'm going to fess up. I haven't read the whole document either because I was in meetings this afternoon. Um, but I would be interested in having BPD respond to the Novak report. There are multiple models presented in there um, and I haven't had a conversation yet of any length about whether or not those models would work and whether or not they would actually be effective here uh, and whether or not we have the resources to pull them off. So at some point I would be interested in that take. Um, I'm also interested, it seems like a lot of the discussion tonight turned around whether or not social, worker, social workers have a place in BPD, whether or not they are appropriately placed there. Um, and I've heard two sides of that. I found it really helpful um, to sit down with Melissa Stone, our, our BPD social worker, and talk about that. I had her as a guest at one of my constituent meetings. Um, and at some point, I would be interested in her take because she's heard all these conversations too. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting question we still have to face. Um, as I think about this, and as I look ahead to the budget hearing on the 30th and the ultimate decisions, here are the questions I keep coming back to. I, I was writing these as we talked tonight. Um, first of all, in terms of public safety and in terms of the Bloomington Police Department, do we successfully hire and effectively retain the right people? Not just officers, not just positions, but are we able to attract the kinds of officers that fit our community values? Um, the second question, do we as council members do everything we can to ensure that the people we do hire can be successful in serving this community? Do they have the resources they need? Do they, do they have a toolkit from which to draw? And that may include, and that goes beyond just equipment. That also goes to the presence of a social worker, perhaps. Um, do we give them what they need to serve our community in a way that is consistent with our values here? And then my third question, do, they, do we hold them accountable when they don't? What procedures, what processes are in place to hold officers accountable um, when they don't serve this community in the way they should? So those are the three questions shaping my thinking um, as we go forward. Again, I am grateful to my colleagues. I learned from your questions. I am grateful to everyone who spoke tonight um, because you are informing a very important discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, being the chair, um, I'll have final comments. However, what I am going to do is um, cede my time. I do believe the deputy clerk has five public comments remaining. So I'll give up my time in order to hear from these five folks and then we will end the meeting after that. Um, again, we're trying to maintain the two hour time limit. Um, I do am sorry that we didn't get to everyone, but uh, I think this will be the, the best thing that I can do as chair. So Deputy Clark, will you please proceed? Sure, RM uh, Renee, I believe is next and they should be unmuted. Um, hello, uh, Chair. Uh, hello, Renee, I'm sorry, Renee. Can uh, you state your full name, please? Yes, it's Renee Miller. Uh, and Thank you. 
Thank you for giving us time to go ahead and, and speak. I actually wrote my comments in the comments and I am hoping that you all get them um, from the meeting host as they said that uh, they would pass them on to you so it's in writing. <clears throat> I think uh, Chief Dekoff uh, is well aware of what I'm going to share now. Uh, because this was shared back during the farmer's market with not only the mayor, but with him. Um, many of us at that farmer's market watched as many of his officers while, while patrolling gave the uh, three percenters a nod, kudos, thumbs up, as well as the white supremacists with no, um, no concern for us uh, whatsoever. So there's that. So it's disingenuous to say that there are no white supreme or no racist uh, officers on the force. I'm not saying all of them are, but there certainly are some. We saw them. So there's that. Um, and I lost track after I wrote it all out to you folks. So my apologies for that. Um, we have been asking and still have not heard from you, Council. Um, uh, or the police department uh, about whether or not you will be doing the BLM training. We would at least like an answer. We've been asking for uh, a month, if not two. I don't think it's a lot to ask for that answer to be public. Um, and thank you. If you could do that, we would all appreciate it. And um, I yield my time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Miller. If you sent those comments to us, we will get them. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, Ms. McDowell. Next is eMoney, and they should be unmuted. Howdy. Uh, Edward Lennon here. Uh, I'll I'm just go on on uh, Councilor. Uh, uh, Can you state your full I name, see? please? Oh, sorry, Edward Lennon. Thank you. Uh, again, I was just saying, I, I think BPD has a, a definite disadvantage at retaining officers. Uh, they, they do have some fine officers there, but, uh, you know, policing nationwide is, uh, it's a struggle to get people to, to apply now because, you know, which is understandable because why would anybody want to be a cop and get, you know, berated by people like they do. But, um, so yeah, just speak to that point. And then uh, my final comment, uh, I just think it's quite hilarious that, you know, when the, uh, the, the people were in town Saturday evening and they <laughs> drove, drove down to Hammy's house, that first thing he did was call the police because he was scared of the people outside. And that's, that's my comment. Thank you for uh, ceding your time, Councillor Sims, to uh, allow some additional public comment. It was my pleasure. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. McDowell? Teal Bingham, and they should be on. Hi, um, I'm Teal Bingham, resident of Bloomington. Can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you. Cool. Um, first, I just want to say that if the chief of police cannot speak clearly about systemic racism and its effects on his department, it's clear to me that the training that they are receiving is inadequate. Um, to make the kinds of statements that he did, whether they were an error or not, shows that he does not understand implicit bias and systemic racism, and that he needs better training, let alone that of his officers. I think that an outside organization, a third party, should be determining the materials and the presenters of that training. Um, BLM Bloomington is a great resource, as well as many others and many IU professors who could help contribute to uh, better training for our community. The second thing I want to speak to, um, Susan Sandberg touched on the fact that social workers or, and police, neither social workers nor police, can solve the root of crime. That is the actual problem that we are here to talk about. They can't solve it. That's why they are not doing an adequate job of protecting communities in poverty, communities of color, or our community as a whole, as Daniel referenced in the clearance rates. We need to divert money from the police department and fund initiatives that can work on the root problems, not just social work, but housing and various resources like many other people have referenced that will reduce the perceived need for police, reduce crime, which will end up protecting the police officers that so many people are concerned about 
um, as well as the community as whole as a whole and will make everyone safer. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, do, who do we have next, Ms. McDowell? Uh, committee Chair, that's it for first round speakers. There are two okay. additional people with their hands raised. Um, actually, we're at 8.01, um, so we've had our time. And if there are no more first rounders, um, I think um, we've at least met that objective this evening. Um, as the chair, um, I did have final comments, but I ceded my time to but, hear from um, the remaining council members. Um, and I will make those comments known later um, when there's an opportunity. So again, I wanna thank my committee chair members, Chief Decoff for being here. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Lucas. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I don't know if the clerk uh, uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe uh, Kel's iPhone is a, is a first round commenter. Um, and I know, uh, I believe she's I, had her hand I, raised for quite some I, time. I thought we had that iPhone at the first round. Am I incorrect on that? Uh, there may have been someone else with a similar screen name. Um, I know a lot of folks uh, log in as, as iPhones. So um, I, I believe this particular commenter uh, has had her hand raised for quite some time. And uh, uh, Okay, I think we can allow that. Um, this will be the last commenter for this evening. And in advance, thank everyone, including the public for being here this evening. Um, Ms. McDowell, can you unmute this yes, Kel's iPhone? Thank you. Kel's iPhone should be unmuted now. Kel, Hi, thank you for thank waiting. You. Thank you, no problem. I understand the confusion. Um, yes, a similar name talked, but I hadn't. So um, thanks for responding to my comment. Um, I just wanted to say so many people have echoed Jada B here, um, who, um, yes, I I'm think- I'm sorry, it, could you, st I'm really sorry to interrupt. Could you state your full name for the record, please? Yes, it's Kel T. Um, and so again, um, Jada B, wealth of knowledge, huge asset to our community. Um, and I just want to say that it, it seems pretty ridiculous to me that Black Lives Matter, who JW is, is very connected with and involved with, hasn't yet been hired for the training that they've been offering for quite some time now. Um, and they do need to be paid for that work, uh, like absolutely. And so I just want to say I, I'm confused why that hasn't happened yet. And that I think that, in my opinion, DCOF's statement today demonstrates the need exactly for why that training is needed. It's a patently absurd statement to say that there's no institutional racism in BPD when they arrest 400 times the rate of black people than white people for the possession of marijuana. So it's exactly the same crime. And when 24% of the use of force is against black people, which I'm not sure of the exact percentage of the community that's black, but it is far lower than that. That is hugely disproportionate. So obviously there's an immense amount of unconscious bias in both the chief of police as well as the rest of the police department, which is incredibly dangerous. In fact, more dangerous in many ways than explicit racism, which research supports, because we have to be aware of our racism in order to identify it when it's showing up for us so that we can choose to act in a different way. Otherwise we're governed and controlled by those biases and prejudices, which leads inherently to violence or at least complicity in white supremacy. And so it's clear that so much work needs to be done in this. And that's one example of the way that funds traditionally routed to police could be rerouted in these defunding efforts is by getting these trainings to our, to our government, for example, your city council. Um, I also want to respond to someone earlier who said, was talking about suicide by cop and the dangers of, I, I'm not even sure what exactly they were saying, suicide by cop can't exist if there aren't an abundance of cops in, in the streets that people know are going to shoot them if they engage with them in any way and particularly engage in anything perceived as a threatening way. Um, and then finally, I just, I've said this numerous times at many different council meetings, these rules of order and the way these meetings are structured is so inaccessible for so many people and leads to immense lack of accountability because we don't hear back. We say these things about Chief Decoff or about the city council and there's no even opportunity to respond back, let alone mandate that that's done. So we talk and talk and talk and then y'all make whatever decisions you make. Kelty, thank I'm sorry, you're out of time. Thank you, nope, that's great, thanks. I'm sorry. 
Thank you, meeting host. I missed you there for a second. Um, again, I would like to thank everyone this evening for being here. Um, the only comments I will make is that we will uh, move forward with continued meetings. Um, there has been some other suggestions that I couldn't get to tonight that I think will bear fruit moving on to the forward, and we will share that with you as soon as we can um, to the general public. Thank you all, and have a good night.